spotted dick. Welcome back to another Business Blaze. It's your boy with the Blaze, Simon. In this YouTube channel, on this YouTube channel, what happens is Danny writes me a script. This is it. It's an absolute beast. This is not an epic Blaze, but it may as well be. It's very long. Danny writes it. I reads it. Sam adds some memes afterwards. Let's get cracking. The 10... Oh, wait, it's not 10. I guess I'm just very used to hosting a Top 10s channel. Inventions we're all very disappointed that we don't have yet. I believe this was my suggestion, but I'm not sure. Whenever we get reasonably close to Christmas time in the UK, Danny, it is May, the bookshelves of the shop suddenly get flooded with this year's new batch of annuals. They do? What the f is this? Is this like the Guinness Book of World Records? While other countries seem to have their own versions of annuals largely relating to comic strips and, ma comic strips and magazines, the UK format is a curiously distinctive phenomenon. Is it? I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> They're usually fairly slim, but quite pricey hardcover books related to the latest TV shows, toys, bands, sports, and whatever else the kids are into this year. What are we talking about? This is supposed to be about inventions and we're talking about TV books. Depending on when you were born, you could pick up anything from a Rupert the Bear annual to a Masters of the Universe annual, from a My Little Pony annual to a Teletubbies annual. All right. Um... <laughs> to know any of these. I mean, I know of these. I don't know what Masters of the Universe is, but I know the other three. Uh, My Little Pony and Teletubbies really suck. Also, what the f*** up with bronies? That is, I, I only found out about this maybe last year. Weird, very weird. Not judge. No, I am judging. Like someone the other day was on Twitter, like having a go at me for something, and they were like, "You shouldn't kink shame." And I was like, "Bro, look, if you're a brony, just know." They were essentially just cheaply produced stocking fillers for kids, packed with stories, photographs, puzzles, games, and faintly relevant articles. Confusingly for my young brain, Danny's young brain, the covers were always labelled with next year's date rather than the current year, but I later discovered this was so that the books wouldn't look too out of date after Christmas was over and the shops had resorted to shoving any unsold annuals into the bargain bin to try and quickly get rid of them. All the cool shit had usually disappeared by this time, but you could usually find a whole stack of Railway World annuals going cheap. I, I do sometimes wonder, like, what happens with my childhood, because this is something that Danny is obviously very au fait with, and I have just never even heard of. <laughs> As a kid, I was always into watching sci-fi TV shows, so if I was lucky, my own Christmas stocking might include something like a Doctor Who, Buck Rogers, or Blake's Seven Annual. Uh, I know the first two. I've never seen them, of course. I don't even know what Blake Seven is. You uncultured swine! Simon won't have heard of Blake Seven. <laughs> Holy <laughs> Okay. It was basically a British version of Star Trek, except everyone in the show was a mercenary bastard. That sounds pretty awesome. Uh, the thing about these is that you only get so much content relating to the TV show. The rest of the stuff is often boring filler, factual material loosely related to science and outer space and stuff. It would be a bit disappointing if you bought like the Star Trek annual and it was just like, here's the facts about space. It's like annual, I've got Simon Whistler on YouTube for that shit. I don't need it from you. For example, this was how I first discovered that dogs are better than humans because they beat us in becoming the first living creatures to orbit the Earth. That's true, but who put them there, Danny? That was us! Humans are better than dogs. We've all, we all know this, and we've all agreed on it. I know at first many of you disagreed, but then I persuaded you with my convincing arguments, and you all came around to my position. And then we started eating dogs. It was the 2019 dog genocide. But there was one type of intriguing article that kept cropping up quite frequently over the years within the pages of these annuals. What the world will look like in the future, or something more specific, what the world will look like in the year 2000. Oh my god. Oh yeah, some of these from the past, it's like, yeah, we'll all be living like the Jetsons by like 1983. <laughs> that didn't happen, disappointingly. I want a car that goes bloop, 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 bloop. Was that the Jetsons? I think that's Futurama actually, isn't it? Who knows? It's been a long time since I watched 
both the Jetsons and Futurama. You ain't cultured swine! Z, they were usually accompanied by glorious artwork depicting human beings in flashy silver spacesuits, pissing around in jetpacks, or getting served dinner by giant talking robots. And I was often fascinated to learn about the thrilling life I was going to lead when I became a grown up. Some of the predictions were pretty bang on the money, too. Ooh, I'm glad we're talking about some that actually were there. We only had four TV channels to choose from in the UK when I was a kid. Same for me. When I was a kid, they introduced the fifth channel, and it was like, whoa, ho, ho, what are we gonna do? So much content. And now the idea of having five channels which are mostly filled with adverts is just like, you know, you just turn on the TV, and it'd be like, well, we're halfway through a James Bond movie from the 1960s. It's like, Guess that's what I'm watching tonight. <laughs> so I couldn't quite believe the day might come when I would be able to flick through over a hundred of them. And then, like, yeah, we got Sky. I don't know, I must have been like 13, 14. And then suddenly there were hundreds of channels and I was like, wow, this is great. They were still stuffed with adverts. And now the idea of even, like my parents still have Sky. So when I go to the UK and I visit them and I'm like, hey guys, what's up? And they're like, oh yeah, we got, we're gonna watch some TV. And it's like, wow, but there's adverts and shit. And I don't, wh why? <laughs> why, you have Netflix? What are we doing? <laughs> The accompanying illustration of a big chunky TV set with over a hundred big buttons on the front didn't quite encapsulate how it would work, but the prediction was broadly right. Even though the article neglected to mention that the channels would largely just be clogged up with an ever-ending cycle of repeats of Judge Judy and Friends. Those are shows I do know. Both are quite entertaining. Judge Judy is a little bit weird. Friends, I like Friends. Other predictions tend to be along the right lines, but we still quite haven't got there yet. Self-driving cars are still meant to be on the way, but ideally we need to get to the point where they can accurately identify hazards and stop killing pedestrians before they become a regular height on the superhighways of tomorrow. What's the difference between a superhighway and a regular highway? I guess it's got automatic cars on them. Although I have driven one of those Teslas, and I was quite impressed by its ability to drive itself. I mean, it's not perfect, and you get to like a roundabout or some <laughs> and it'll be like, help, I don't know what I'm doing. You just gotta grab the wheel and take over. <laughs> Which I mean is the point, but it is alarming when it just starts screaming at you to grab the wheel because <laughs> it doesn't know what to do. <laughs> Jesus, Tesla, but I'm drunk now. <laughs> and we do not really, I haven't really drunk over Tesla. <laughs> just in case that wasn't obvious. Uh, and we do seem to be dragging our shoes on this one a bit. On what? Oh, the superhighways. Okay. Electronic Age magazine was predicting the rise of the electronic drive car as early as 1958, but we're still waiting for them over 60 years later. No, we're not. We've got Teslas and electric cars and all, you know, the other ones that I can't name, but I'm sure the other brands of electric cars. The, the, the... I saw an e-golf the other day, like a Volkswagen e-golf. I guess it's fully electric because it had the electric license plate. Meanwhile, while robot technology is continually evolving, we're not quite reached the point where every household includes a giant silver mechanical man wearing an apron and sorting out the laundry. Disappointingly so. In fact, we've maybe lost sight of our priorities on this one. I strongly suspect that robots of the future will have learned how to satisfy depraved sexual cravings long before it learns how to take a dog for a walk or put the garbage out. And that's true. Like, it's it's known, like, in the video world, like, the Porn sites lead the charge, and then all the other video sites like YouTube are like, oh, that's a good feature, isn't it? They are the true innovators. Bored of some of the other inventions that we were promised a long time ago in factual articles and speculative works of fiction that haven't materialized in the modern world. So, two pages in, we're finally getting into the title of today's content. Smash that dislike button. Simon. Uh, don't you, you took 10 minutes to get to the title of the video. It's clickbait. It's not. Welcome to Business Blaze. There is far more f around than on other channels. If you don't like it, you are free to leave. I will wait. Many months later. Moving on. The hoverboard. I'd like to think that even Simon has at least watched Back to the, the Back to the Future movies. I have many times. They're fantastic. And as soon as we start talking about Back to the Future, we instinctively start to think about all the cool inventions that were predicted in its bold vision of the 21st century. Which is a bit weird, really, as only the second film in the trilogy actually went into the future, and it's widely considered to be the weakest of the three by far, although I love all of them. Unpopular opinion, the second Back to the Future is actually my favorite one. It's clearly 2-1-3, in my opinion. Of course, another weird thing that might make some of us feel 
odd is that real life has long caught up with a vision of 2015 that was presented in the second futuristic film. So by now we should all be making the most of auto-adjusting and self-drying jackets, sneakers with power laces, bionic brain implants, robotic gas stations, incredibly accurate weather forecasts, and most famously of all, hoverboards. There were bionic brain implants? I don't even remember that. And I saw this movie recently. Anyway, let's carry on. In fact, the name hoverboard, essentially meaning a levitating skateboard without wheels, well, obviously without wheels, because it's levitating. And I mean, you could put the wheels on there, but it'd be a bit pointless. What are they for? Oh, it's in case it runs out of batteries. <laughs> But of course, that wouldn't be a problem in the future because of fusion technology or some b****. Uh, this was first coined several decades before Back to the Future, made popular, uh, cropping up in the 1967 novel called The Hole in the Zero, the Story of the Future by M.K. Joseph. It's one prediction of the future that you might be fooled into thinking actually came true. If you take a look online, you'll come across a whole range of hoverboards that you can buy today, but they're a far cry from the fictional Mattel version that Marty McFly uses in the films. Yeah, I remember seeing a video of one of these a few years ago, and he was like, wow, we've invented a hoverboard, guys. And it's like, well, it barely hovers. It's absolutely massive, and you can only use it over this specific area. And it's like, well, yeah, not really. And then what are those stupid things with the wheels on the side that kind of like cheap ass segways they were called hoverboards and i saw them advertised and i was like that's not a hoverboard is it you f***ing liars. Uh, the main issue with the real hoverboards is they, they have wheels and they don't hover. Ah, yeah, these Segway things. A more accurate description of, the, a description of them would be self-balancing scooters, which you control by moving your feet a bit like a hands-free version of a Segway. Those things f suck. Another big problem with them, allegedly. Another big problem with them is they have an alarming tendency to randomly explode. The cheap lithium-iron batteries located in the footrests of the scooters have been known to overheat and catch fire without warning, resulting in several disasters, including the emergency evacuation of a shopping mall in in Washington and the burning down of a whole house in Louisiana. Also, who evacuated a shopping mall because someone something caught on fire? Is that really necessary? <laughs> in very recent years, several startup companies have claimed to be developing the world's first real hoverboard. I should read these ahead, I apologize. Because now I tell you a story, Danny tells you a story, people in the st comments are gonna be like, Simon, you should read the scripts. Actually, people in the comments are usually like, Simon, never read the scripts ahead because we love you repeating yourself. Oh. In 2014, a prototype for the Hendo hoverboard was unveiled, which operates on the principle of electromagnetic repulsion. The downsides are that it would cost around $10,000 to buy, it only hovers if it's directly above a copper surface, and it would only stay up for seven minutes before requiring a recharge. It allegedly sounds pretty sh doesn't it? Allegedly. <laughs> Later in 2015, the car company Lexus revealed that they had been pissing about with something called the Lexus Slide, which uses superconductors cooled with liquid nitrogen. Holy sh**. That sounds complicated. The downsides is that one would have to still fill up your board with liquid nitrogen at minus 322 degrees Fahrenheit every time you take it for a spin, and it only works above completely magnetic surfaces, so not ideal for quick hops into town. Also, the estimated price tag is so huge, Lexus daren't even tell us what it is. What are you doing, Lexus? Focus on making cars, not sh hoverboards that no one likes, allegedly. So it's unlikely that we'll ever really see a Back to the Future style hoverboard any time this century, partly because the very idea does defy the laws of gravity. Yes, it does. And also because very few companies would be interested in investing in any great, uh, any great amount of money into a product which is only destined to get banned within the first week on sale anyway. Yeah, like, I don't know how it is in the US, but uh, in the UK, a lot of those like electric skateboards and stuff are, are just banned because... I don't actually know. Is there a good reason pedestrians get pissed off with them? Who gives a f***? It's fine. Kids are barely allowed to play with fidget spinners these days, so you really think we'd dare let them loose on the streets with a hoverboard? Uh, yeah, I guess not. The government will ruin our fun. But that would be epic. The teleport. Oh, please be about teleporters. I mean, this is so far off that it's like, who could possibly think that this would be available anytime in the at all near future. There were some things I never quite grasped about teleportation in Star Trek. Although I've watched a fair bit of it over the years, I've also missed a lot of stuff, so I'm not an expert. Maybe a business blaze tracker will have to answer these points. Tell you what, Danny, I'm a pretty massive fan of Star Trek, so let's see if I can do you a favor right now. Firstly, what's the point of the transporter room? Well, Danny, it transports you places, which is pretty f***ing cool. On the return journey from the surface of a mysterious planet, the crew can seemingly be picked up from any position, often just in the nick of time, to avoid a grisly fate at the hands of a giant, hairy testicle monster. So why do they need to stand in such precise positions in a specific room on the outward journey? I don't know, 
to be honest. I don't think so. I don't think I know the answer. I think it's I would guess it's because, like, in the law, uh, they need to either go from one or be transported back to one. But then they also have site-to-site -site transportation, um, which appears definitely in Voyager, and I imagine in other series where it's like, they are just somewhere and then they will transport to another location. It's often used as a plot device. It's pretty cool. I imagine it's just like a more reliable transport, perhaps, or if they're transporting off ship. It would make more sense if they had to do the same thing on the way back, but they don't. I'm sure I saw later episodes where people were getting beamed all over the place without ever having to leave their comfy chair, so I'm not sure if the transport of room was just a glorified social hall. It's like, <laughs> yeah, they, in later episodes they just turned into a restaurant. Secondly, in the recent J.J. Abrams film char films, characters seemingly have the power to pretty much teleport to and from anywhere at all, which begs the question, why do they even bother building spaceships? <laughs> Good question. Because, well, they can't transport, like, across extremely large distances. Although there has been episodes with alien technology where that has been possible. Oh my god, I'm a f***ing nerd. Carrying on. Of course, the concept of human teleportation has existed in works of science fiction long before Kirk and Pointy Ears materialized on TV, first showing up in 1897 in a novel by Fred T. Jane called To Venus in Five Seconds, which pretty much summarizes the plot. In the real world, it's easy to see the advantages of an invention that can transport you from your sofa to a business meeting on the other side of the world in just a few seconds without you even having to open your front door. But it's also an invention that would pretty much turn the world as we know it completely on its head everyone would suddenly get very fat for starters i've also thought about this like if transporters exist real estate prices would get really f***ed up because it's like oh yeah you could like work in the city and live in the middle of the forest with basically no problems whatsoever so all of that high priced city real estate is going to be you know it's going to be a lot cheaper all of a sudden so in star trek where they transport like around the world all the time instantly because it's all short distances um, yeah, real estate in that world must be really screwed up, but also they don't have money, so there's that. Entire industries and millions of jobs would be rendered obsolete overnight. Oh yeah, that too. <laughs> Terrorists would find that life had suddenly got a lot simpler. <laughs> in fact, how would you even begin to fight a war in a world with te where teleportation exists? All traditional military tactics would be wiped out in a second. I'm not sure if this would mean that nobody would even consider starting one, or if they'd just be very quick indeed. Either way, it might be best that we never find out. I don't know, it's I assume that at some point, some sort of transport is going to be invented, and it's going to be awesome. Because you could say, it's like, oh my god, the machine gun would totally change the way we do war. You can just kill hundreds of people instantly, and it's like, yeah, that happened, and it did. And it wasn't great, but this is the world we now live in. Technology has to move on, and that's guns. It's like purpose is killing. The thing about teleportation in science fiction is that the idea was always far more rooted in fiction than it was in science. It was just really, it was just a really convenient plot device. The only reason that the Starship Enterprise had a largely defective transporter room in the first place is because, I know this, because the budget of the original show didn't allow for a visual depiction of a whole spaceship landing on a different planet's surface each week. Although the science world did seem to get excited back in 1993 when it was announced that quantum teleportation had first been discovered. But this wasn't really ever the first step to human teleportation that many people believed at the time. Did anyone really believe that? I don't I don't remember when this came out, but I am familiar with quantum teleportation because it's interesting and it is not the same thing. And anyone who thought it was the same thing just reads too many headlines and not enough information. Uh, it was more to do with the transmitting of quantum information through shared quantum entanglement rather than any actual teleportation of particles that we would normally associate with the term. And it's highly unlike and it's not interesting because of the teleportation, it's interesting because I believe the the information transmitted, although not observable, at a speed faster than the speed of light. Which is, well, that's a thing. And it's highly unlikely that mankind will ever get to see real teleportation, even hundreds of years from now, because the very idea of transferring 32 trillion cells in a human being from one place to another without traveling through the physical space between them goes against our current understanding of physics. So, Uber drivers probably have nothing to worry about for a long time yet, except their low pay, which we talked about on another Business Plays video. Though, I'm not going to link to it below because I'm can't be bothered. You can YouTube search it if you want. It doesn't matter to me that much. Food in a tiny pill. This would be cool. 
Here's a very familiar scene from countless sci-fi films and books and TV shows which may not appear particularly exciting or something that you'd actually look forward to experiencing yourself in the future, yet it could be the most important invention on this list by far. Danny, we just talked about transportation, which if invented would literally change everything. And now it's like, yeah, food in the pill is gonna be amazing. <laughs> oh. You say, what have you invented? I've invented a transporter. What have you invented? I've invented food in a pill form. Well, pretty clear who the Nobel Prize goes to on this one, isn't it? Pillboy. Oh, the usual, the scene usually involves a modern day character who has somehow stepped into a distant tomorrow. Having got his head around the flying cars and shrink rays and the talking parking meters and the fax machine mailboxes, he settles down for a bite to eat. A phrase that I always want to say, eat to bite, because of that, the Terminal movie with Tom Hanks. But he's simply given a small pill to pop in, which apparently satisfies his raging appetite in one small gulp and keeps him going until supper time. I'd be into this. Like, I don't, I don't generally stop work for lunch. I just have like a, a, a protein, not like a protein shake, like a meal replacement thing. I have meal replacement for breakfast and lunch because you just drink it while I just drink it while I work, and then I have a proper meal in the evening, and that's all I eat. I would just have the food pill, it'd be great. Uh, in some variations on the theme, the pill even replicates the feeling of eating a three-course meal, with a hungry diner gradually feeling full after his taste buds have gone through everything on the pill's menu of the day. That doesn't seem realistic. In the 1930s sci-fi musical Just Imagine, the protagonist swallows his first futuristic pill and then declares that the roast beef was a little tough. Hilarious. Also, this would be this Just Imagine thing, never heard of it, but it would be a conflict for me because I love sci-fi, but there is very little I hate more than f musicals. However, the the only musical that I've ever found remotely acceptable was something that not wasn't even really a musical, and it was that Jack Black movie where they teach the kids how to play rock music. That was f great. However, the origins of the food pill were rooted in 19th century feminism long before they started popping up and down in science fiction. Oh, popping up and down. But a bum bum. Uh, back in 18, how on earth has this got to do anything with feminism? Back in 1883, the American Press Association invited a wide mix of contemporary writers to submit their articles on how they felt the world would look like in a hundred years' time. American suffragette Mary Elizabeth Lease note to Simon of the future: Don't push the script away when you're in the middle of someone's name. It makes it harder to read. Submitted a piece which predicted the rise of small files of synthetic food which would furnish men with substance for days and liberate women from the kitchens from their kitchen stove prisons. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. That's how we get women out of the kitchen. <laughs> Pill food. Later in 1887, social conservative Anna Dodd, who had no time for any of this feminism malarkey, wrote a tongue-in-cheek novella called The Republic of the Future, which approached the idea of food pills with a big spoonful of irony. The narrator of the story is there to be lampooned and she, as she makes the claim, when the last piece of pie was made into the first pellet, women's true freedom began. All I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. I mean, it's 1887, the concept is there, and Anna Dodd sounds like a bit of a dicko. Uh, of course, it's perfectly understandable why most lovers of fine cuisine won't be particularly thrilled about the idea of replacing a well-prepared meal with a pill. No, but you can still eat a fancy meal, or whatever, it's just there's an option of the pill. Why not? It also be very convenient for camping because you don't have to carry a ton of food with you. Just like take a pill, boom. Shoving a little tablet in your mouth is hardly a substantial substitute for a hearty plate of toad in the hole, followed by a generous serving of spotted dick and custard. For once, Danny and I are on the same page with food. Both of those things are absolutely delicious. Also, if you're watching, and I guess if you're not British, I don't know if spotted dick is an American food, but it is very interestingly named. Spotted. Dick, which we had it at school, I think, on Thursday lunchtimes, maybe. Uh, and yeah, it was a lot of fun to, you know, spotted dick. Ha! Gay! Ah, uh, but we need to think beyond our own taste buds to look 
at the wider picture. If the human race ever were to develop a complete, wholesome meal in a pill which could be cheaply produced and distributed, the invention could provide an easy solution to international food shortages or perhaps even eradicate world hunger altogether. I mean, we've still got to get the calories that go in the pill somehow. It's not like they're magically coming from nowhere, unless we invent something that makes them magically come from nowhere, but that sounds like a bit of a stretch. Sadly, although military programs are coming up with increasingly compressed rations of food and pills which can at least help keep ravishing hunger at bay for short periods, there's no way we will ever realistically pack enough calorific content into a single pill which would keep us going all day. Danny, you don't have any you don't have any faith in the future. Food pills, I mean, it's gonna happen at some point. It definitely will. I mean, because I don't know how much energy in like terms of gasoline or something would be in something this big, but you can measure the caloric energy in that. And it's probably pretty enormous. So all we need to do is work out a way for to turn gas in terms of calories, or petrol or whatever, into calories that we can consume, and then we'll just be drinking petrol. Don't drink petrol. Don't get any ideas. Drink bleach. Not really. Don't do any of that advice. And I see all those crazy people on YouTube with their COVID-19 bull drinking bleach. Don't fuck with that, you sicko. Three wolves would be angry. That coffee is ice cold. And it's not ice coffee, it's just coffee that I let go cold. Unless we start eating thousands and thousands of them every day, and that kind of makes the whole concept a bit pointless. If you're still keen on the idea of never having to prepare or eat food ever again, perhaps the closest we'll get to now are the thick and creamy paste-like drinks, which apparently contain everything your body needs for a proper meal. These are what I eat. Uh, one guy called Rob Reinhardt, a 24-year-old software engineer from Atlanta, has developed such a drink called Soylent, which he claims has the potential to change the world's relationship with food. I'm slightly put off by the fact that it looks like vomit. Yeah, the food I drink doesn't look particularly good, but it is. Uh, it tastes it doesn't really taste of anything like the way i describe it is they've mastered the taste of nothing i'm even more put off by the fact that it's named after the plentiful food stuff featured in the future earth visions of the classic 1973 film soylent green which of course i've never seen but i am familiar with the concept the food was revealed at the end to be spoiler alert made from dead human bodies i think modern consumers would find that just a little hard to swallow it does seem like an interesting name for your drink after that robbo anyway next up Jetpacks. Now, jetpacks, it's like, I think the answer is pretty simple of why we don't have them. It's just they require a ton of energy to make work, and we just can't fit that much energy in a jetpack for like a long time. Maybe we will in the future with like when we can store energy more densely, but that's a pretty major hurdle to overcome. Here's an unusual entry on this list. I'm probably just covering stuff that Danny is about to cover, so I'm just gonna shut up and read. Here's an unusual entry on this list because it could be argued that jetpacks do actually exist. Yes, but they're shite. The main problem here is not so much technology, although that does obviously play a part, but more to do with the fact that the wide use of jetpacks would be a hopelessly stupid idea that could never feasibly get off the ground. Oh, come on, Danny. A fully functional jetpack, like on Grand Theft Auto. San Andreas? Is that where they have the jetpack? That would be awesome. When we think of jetpacks, we usually think of a bulky backpack that behaves a bit like a rocket, belching out flames from canisters of compressed gas as it propels us into the air and gets us quickly to the pub without having to worry about navigating our way through busy traffic. And straight away, it's not hard to see an immediate design problem with that. Human beings often tend to complain about getting a bit saddle sore after riding a bicycle for half an hour, so you can imagine the sh storm that's likely to unfold after you've effectively blowtorched your legs for any length of time. Agreed. People would definitely complain about that. The world's first jetpack patents was actually issued way back in 1919 to Russian pilot Alexander Andreev, although it appears that he never got around to actually building a complete working model. Fast forward to 1984, and jetpack pilot William Souter wowed the crowds at the opening ceremony at the Los Angeles Summer Olympics as he blasted into the air using a rocket belt model, which had been in development since the 1950s and used pressurized hydrogen peroxide for fuel. Isn't hydrogen peroxide that stuff you use to dye your hair white? He was only in the air for less than 20 seconds before he came down to land in the stadium, and the piece of kit made about 130 decibels of noise. That is goddamn loud. The worldwide audience of 2.5 billion, poorly not. Oh, Summer Olympics. Yeah, possibly. That's still a lot, especially in 1984. I, I don't get the, I don't think I've ever really watched the Olympics. It just seems pretty boring to me. I mean, I don't like sports in general, and it's like the Olympics just takes all the most boring sports, like throwing sticks and running around in circles, and it ignores all the interesting sports. So I don't understand the appeal. Who cares? It's just a big waste of money. Uh, the worldwide audience of 2.5 billion seem to enjoy it, but you have to question whether those 20 seconds of glory are worth 30 years of engineering. 
they weren't. I'll tell you right now. Later in 2015, Australian businessman David Maiman, the CEO of Jetpack Aviation, was filmed flying around the Statue of Liberty in New York in a model called the JB9 Jetpack, which runs on kerosene and uses two vector jet engines. Sounds like some Iron Man right there. It's claimed that the JB9 can stay in the air for a whole 10 minutes before needing a refuel, but such a trip could be very expensive if the model ever went to market. Although Jetpack Aviation hasn't released any figures, it's estimated that the kit would have cost $250,000. That's pretty awesome. And that's a lot of money to spend on something that can only keep you in the air for a few minutes. 20 minutes is not a few minutes, Danny. That sounds pretty awesome. Uh, the main problem with jetpacks is that they're never likely to be as useful as promised in the books and films. They're fine for occasional stunts and spectacles, like showing off a bit at the Olympics opening ceremonies, but it's very unlikely that we'll ever see a marketable model which is light enough to be worn whilst big enough to store the energy required to keep it mobile for more than a few minutes. And I have to say, while I was ragging on the Olympics, the opening ceremonies are usually pretty cool, if a little bit cheesy. And also, was it China who did that? insane one that cost them just an insane amount of money in 2008 and it's just like okay well they beat us didn't they we don't need to try anymore because i saw the london one and i was like wow this is really impressive but you remember that china one right <laughs> even if we did somehow manage to bypass newton's laws of motion a health and safety nightmare. It's one thing to fall off your bike, but it's quite another to come crashing down into a housing estate in a ball of flames. And I can't help thinking that Greta Thunberg might have something to say if we all suddenly start flying around in our own personal fuel-guzzling jetpacks. Okay, like, yeah, this is bad. Uh, you know, normally I'd make fun of Greta Thunberg. And someone pointed out, Simon, it's not fun to make fun of people who are younger than you. And I'm like, I don't care. You're watching the wrong channel. <laughs> Ultimately, the last hundred years of jetpack development have so far resulted in a device which can thrust you into the air for a few minutes at a cost of hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yes, for the original device, but then it's not going to cost you that every trip, is it, Danny? God damn! And as a practical vehicle, it's not even in the same league as the Sinclair C5. If you get that joke, you original gangster business blaze legend, thank you. Bonus false predictions of the future, but we're not, have we got three, we've got two and a half, one and a half pages of bonus predictions of the future that were false, allegedly. Over the course of the 20th century, many scientists, writers, journalists, and futurists made bold predictions about what the world would look like in a hundred years time. And some of them were way off the mark. The Rand Corporation, number one, the Rand Corporation. A global thing, aren't we already like massively into this video? Oh, and last time people were like, Simon, why don't you look at the watch to see what the time is? And it's like, I'm looking at the computer over there, which has the time that the video has been recording on it. This wouldn't really help me out. The Rand Corporation, a global think tank which contributed to both the space program and the development of the internet, once made a curious prediction that in the year 2020 we'd all have apes for butlers. <laughs> Guys, no. <laughs> I don't even know what to say. <laughs> the strangest thing about this prediction is that they made it as recently as 1994? It's 26 years, guys. What the f do you think is going to happen? The Rand Corporation claimed that while some households would choose to go with robot butlers, others would prefer to go with real living creatures such as apes, and by this time will have discovered how to breed intelligent species of apes which are capable of carrying out manual labor. Let's just agree to never listen to anything that the Rand Corporation ever says again because, boys, you be smoking the cr Allegedly. It went on to claim that using highly trained apes as family chauffeurs might even cut down on automobile accidents. Uh, this is an Onion article, right? Jesus. So that seems to be official confirmation that even an ape can drive better than you. But a bum bum. Number two. Acclaimed science writer and author Arthur C. Clarke is one of my favorite wordsmiths of all time. But some of his theories were a bit more bonkers than others. I also like Arthur C. Clarke, Danny. Back in 1966, he claims that by the 21st century, the concept of a moving house would have become a very different experience, although the phrase would also be technically more accurate, because we'd actually be moving our houses. How could we predict it? So instead of packing all our things into cardboard, why are you moving house except to a different house? 
It's like, it defeats the, I mean, yes, location, but that's it. Like, why are you moving house? Well, uh, you know, I need a, a house with an extra bedroom because I have more kids now, or I'm rich and I want to live in a mansion or some shit like that. Like, it'd be a bit disappointing to just move the actual house. Houses of the future wouldn't be permanently fixed to the ground, so we'd effectively all be living in very mobile homes, which could be steered to a nice new location by the seaside in no time at all. So it'd all be just like trailer park boys. I have never seen that show, but it just felt like an appropriate time to bring it up. Friends of mine were talking about it. Uh, I went camping last week and they were like, you gotta see the trailer park boys. And I was like, okay, I'll check it out. I think it's on Netflix. Apparently it's very funny. This could have been a quick and handy solution to dealing with nuisance neighbors, but the idea sadly is yet to take flight. That's never gonna work out. Number three, in 1950, Associated Press writer Dorothy Rowe revealed that the women of the 21st century would be built like brick shithouses. Sh okay. <laughs> Let's see where this one goes. Uh, actually, she didn't quite phrase it like that. Uh, 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 I figured, Danny. Uh, but she did say that the women of tomorrow would be more than six feet tall, have shoulders like a wrestler, and muscles like a truck driver. A truck driver is particularly known for their muscles, don't they sit in truck all day? And this will be down to the fact that women will be eating balanced rations of vitamins and proteins that will produce maximum bodily efficiency. Maybe Dorothy was right. We just haven't found the ba right balanced rations yet. They probably would include heavy steroids. <laughs> Things might have been different if we'd put the limo-driving apes in charge of food science. A bit of boom boom shh. Uh, number four, a final and very recent prediction came in 2012 from Dave Evans, the chief futurist for Cisco Virtual Networking. Yeah, like 2012 was what? Nearly a decade ago, eight years ago. But I mean, that's really a short time to be like, yeah, I'm gonna predict something wild ass crazy about the future. His unusual prediction came by the year 2020. Let's see how this goes, Dave. Uh, everyone would be able to predict the future themselves. Dude, what the f are you smoking? He reckons that we'd able to be use would be able to use cloud-based tools to mine the data of increasingly sophisticated analysis algorithms and make uncanny predictions about tomorrow and beyond. All right. Maybe it's, I mean, was it, was it Newton or someone based on Newton's theories about how with enough information you can predict everything because you know everything obeys Newtonian law? But then it was like, ah, quantum physics came along and was like, oh no, there is an element of randomness which we can't predict. Anyway, I'm not a scientist, but Dave doesn't seem like a scientist either. Maybe it's a good job that he's turned out wrong so far. If this were true, we'd probably all be able to predict the exact date and time of our own deaths, which means that things could get a bit weird. Wasn't there a French movie about that? where everyone was told exactly when they were gonna die and what that meant. Like they had a timer over their head or something. That's some scary shit. And I don't know whether I'd want to know that. Like, it seems a bit like, yeah, no, you don't want to know. But then it's like, or do you? Because if it was like, yes, yeah, I mean, you got six more hours to live, I probably wouldn't be recording a Business Plays video right now. As much as I love it, uh, probably not what I would be doing. <laughs> more importantly than that, the gambling industry would crumble overnight and the horoscope section of every newspaper would disappear forever. I wouldn't say that's important. I would say good. Because we could do without gambling and we could do without horoscopes. Both are pointless and things that you shouldn't do, in my opinion, which is correct. Thank you for watching this episode of Business Blaze. Danny put this script together. I read it. Obviously, you just saw that. Sam is going to add some magical memes, which I haven't seen yet, but you have enjoyed. And thank you for watching. Subscribe. Smash that like or dislike button. And I'll see you next time. And then we started eating dogs.